The straight edge movement has drawn legions of mostly boys to its anti-drug and alcohol message. But to understand where it's headed, you have to look at where it came from. In the 1950s, post-war migration to the suburbs created comfortable middle-class communities whose values were conservative, stable, and square. Rebellion was almost inevitable. In the 1960s, a counterculture youth rejected their parents' values both politically and recreationally. It became an era of experimentation, especially with drugs. And you were either part of the revolution or you weren't. Drag it, man. Try anything once. Shake this square world and blast off for Kicksville. But the party would take its toll. And soon, some kids wanted to try something else. In the 1980s, Straight Edge emerged as an appealing fusion of self-control and in-your-face protest. Yet it began by accident, from a single lyric by the band Minor Threat in 1981. The song, a declaration of an individual choice, lasted 45 seconds. But generations to follow would take it and make it their own. Straight Edge really did emerge from one song that set out the values of Straight Edge. But it wasn't ever intended to be a movement. It must have tapped into something that was going on in our culture at the time. But it's contradictory in the sense that these kids are rebelling by living out what every middle class parent's dreams are in a sense for their children. Inadvertently, a movement had begun, giving rise to a subculture and almost inevitably a militant arm emerged in part because of the man behind this mask we are a group of artists ups punk rockers skaters hardcore kids fighting back we are your children raised on ritalin and prozac biting the hand that's reared us life is tough so get tougher otherwise it's going to chew you up and spit you out you know and that's always kind of been my mentality his name, Elgin James, and in the early 90s, his stomping ground was Boston, Massachusetts. Elgin became straight edge at 13, rebelling against his adoptive parents, who were 60s activists and pot smokers. By 17, he had run away and was living homeless in Boston. Straight edge kept him off drugs, but it also became a means of survival. So lives right here. Right on that second story up there. No heat, no hot water, no electricity. So this pretty much is where it all began. There used to be, you know, crack dealers on this street, you know, and that's when we started hatching the plan of, you know, how we were gonna survive. The plan was simple. Steal what he needed from the criminals who dealt drugs in his front yard. I wasn't gonna victimize anyone innocent. My plan was to victimize the victimizers, which is how we started robbing drug dealers. It was the perfect straight edge crime, buoyed by a kind of Robin Hood spirit. The money went to Elgin and his crew, and then to charities and straight edge bands. It was a violent means to an end. Yeah, you know, my parents had marched with Martin Luther King, so they're pacifists. I got turned on to Huey P. Newton, Stokely Carmichael, and Malcolm X. But every kind of movement does have to have a violent side because you realize pacifism usually doesn't work. In the decentralized, unofficial world of Straight Edge, Elgin and his friend John Buckley began building a more well-defined crew, one that went far beyond the goals and choices of kids who call themselves positive. They gave this new harder edge its own name, FSU. FSU stands for uh, Friends Stand United, Forever Stand United, but it originally started as F*** it up. I wanted to be involved in a straight edge that had balls to it. It was just hard as nails. It wasn't posy. It wasn't about community in the sense of, like, live and let live. It was, you're an army. This new straight edge army moved in on Boston's youth battleground, Lansdowne Street, where Elgin and John worked as bouncers at a club. And drugs, alcohol, and wild partying was the norm. So this is where we came to do the cleaning up. Basically, we were the ones that kept the sons and daughters uh, safe, keeping the drugs out of the clubs. 
For straight edge vigilantes, they were in the perfect position, beating up drunk kids and punishing the drug pushers. That's where many, you know, a drug dealer coming in, chances are he's gonna come on our radar all of a sudden, like, okay, that guy's got something up. We're gonna follow that guy into the bathroom. We're gonna smash his face into the porcelain the toilet bowl. We're gonna empty out the drugs out of his pockets and flush them. Then we're gonna take his big bowl of, you know, roll of cash. And then that's probably gonna last time you're gonna see the guy. There are two ways of doing things. They gave us what we wanted and never came back, or we beat them, took what we wanted, and just turned them over to the cops. That's it. And so few ever came back. The Fuhrer on Lansdowne Street was captured in a video called Boston Beatdown. Given nothing, we are taking everything, making this world a place of our own. Laced with interviews with Elgin, it's a kind of documentary on the state of American youth culture. The director, Ronan Morris, is now a Boston lawyer. The majority of the problems that were out there on the street were alcohol-related. But if you look a little further, what you're really seeing is it's an American culture. It's, you know, it's our society. Whether you want to admit to it, whether you want to ignore it. The violence was meant to shine a mirror on the society they saw with straight-edge eyes. But it also brought attention and worse on Elgin and his crew. People call FSU a gang or say that, you know, like I'm a gang member, like a violent thug. Like we don't deal drugs, you know what I mean? We don't do drive-by shootings. It's basically just a group of kids looking out for each other and watching out for each other. That's just us in front of the rat years and years ago. A couple of them are in jail, and then there are brothers that both passed away. Within two, exactly two weeks from one another? Yeah. I can't believe that a lot of us are alive is what it comes down to. And that's horrible for the, those of us that have passed away. But for a lot of it, mostly comes down to like, wow, most of us should be dead. For Elgin, it was time to move on. I've done my time, I've done my thing. I gave a couple decades to this. And I'm still straight edge, still will always be straight edge. I'm not gonna kick in, in the door of a crack house anymore. My time with that is done. Elgin moved to Hollywood, and John started a poetry press. But what they started in Boston wouldn't just go away. The militant side had taken hold, and it was heading off to new battlegrounds. Looking back on it with 2020 vision, yeah, it probably was eventual that somebody was going to end up getting killed. Its darkest hour was ahead. Coming up, murder in Salt Lake City. Monday.